Psychology Departmental Seminar. Professor Hugo Merchant obtained his PhD in 1997 in the laboratory of Dr. Ranolfo Romo at the National University of Mexico, working on the neurophysiology of decision-making in the somatosensory and premotor systems of rhesus monkeys. He then went on to work at the Brain Sciences Center in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Minnesota, where he was first a postdoctoral fellow and then an associate researcher. In 2004, Professor Merchant started his own systems neurophysiology lab in the Instituto de Neurobiologia at the National University of Mexico as an associate professor. Since then, he's been investigating the neural underpinnings of an interval timing in the frontal lobes of primates. He's published several papers on the psychophysics of time processing in human, healthy humans and in patients with Parkinson's disease using different timing tasks, as well as investigating the neural basis of time quantification in premotor areas in the basal ganglia. In addition, his group has determined the rhythmic entrainment abilities of rhesus sorry, macaques in different tasks and compared these abilities with those of human subjects in parametric fashion. Finally, Professor Merchant's lab has found the neural correlates of interval categorization in premotor and prefrontal areas in behaving monkeys. He has published close to 80 papers in high impact journals and, edit, and has recently edited a book on the neurobiology of interval timing. Professor Merchant's current research involves determining the neurophysiology, sorry, neurophysiological basis of time estimation in the corticothalamic basal ganglia circuits of primates. The topic of uh, Professor Merchant's talk today is the brain dynamics and primate audio motor system during rhythmic timing. Thank you, Professor Merchant, for joining us. We look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here, and I would like to thank uh, Kia Nobre and Anna Mitchell for the invitation to give this talk. Um, I'm going to give a some sort of summary of the research that we have been conducting for uh, almost 15 years now. And at the end, I'm going to show some uh, new data um, regarding, you know, how how's the dynamics of the audio motor system during rhythmic timing. So I will start um, by putting into um, a framework um, time. So organisms have developed different mechanisms to quantify time over a wide range of durations, going from microseconds all the way to daily circadian rhythms. In the middle, you have um, the scale of the hundreds of milliseconds, which is the scenario of crucial behaviors, such as interception and uh, uh, collision avoidance, as well as very cognitive uh, behaviors, such as the perception and production of speech, music, and dance. So this timing then can be divided into what's called interval-based timing and beat-based timing. And today I'm going to talk specifically about, about beat-based timing. So what is that? Beat-based timing refers to the ability to detect the regular pulse or beat in music and to respond synchronously to the beat during dancing and musical ensemble playing. So this is a quite cognitive uh, behavior. It's quite complex. So what I'm showing here is the score of a very simple isochronous piece of music. And this is the auditory input. So the human brain has uh, the, the ability to extract the beat almost immediately. It's, it's kind of a very natural behavior. And we can perceive the beat, extract the pulse of this stimuli, even if uh, there's no stimulus sometimes. So in the case of jazz, for example, you have syncopation and we, our brain can easily keep a beat even if there's not a stimulus. In addition, uh, since this is a behavior that, that is deeply rooted in the motor system, we can entrain to this internal beat very easily. And in fact, our movement happened a few milliseconds before uh, the existence of the stimulus. So this is a very complex audio motor loop 
and uh, it can uh, work even in the absence of stimuli when you keep dancing or keeping the rhythm and the, the music stops. So however, the neural mechanisms behind this complex behavior is, is, is yet quite unknown. And I have dedicated more than half of uh, our efforts in the lab to try to understand some aspects of uh, beat perception and beat entrainment. And the first thing that we confronted is uh, whether beat perception and entrainment uh, can go, um, can generalize to other species because for a long time it has been uh, thought that this is human specific. Uh, but we have little by little uh, find out that there are basic features of beat perception and entrainment present in macaques. So monkey can discriminate speech sound, can extract temporal periodicities, and can produce regular tapping. So the, the initial behavioral task that we use in monkeys is um, a modification of a classical synchronization continuation tapping task. Uh, our version uh, starts when the monkey places its free hand on a lever for a variable delay. And then uh, we present a metronome that consists of very brief stimuli uh, with a constant interstimulus interval. And the monkeys were trained to tap in synchrony with these stimuli for three intervals and then continue tapping the same te tempo, but without the benefit of the metronome. So we have a sensory driven synchronization phase and an internally conducted continuation phase. If the produced intervals were below an error threshold, the animal received a reward in the form of drops of juice. And we use auditory or visual metronomes uh, with intervals ranging from 450 all the way to a second. So here you have a monkey performing the task in the synchronization and the continuation. I will, I will play it again. So this is the, the hand in a key, a starting key. And then continue, and then you, you listen to the reward. So something that we have done in my lab is to try to compare parametrically the psychophysics in monkeys and humans using exactly the same software, hardware, and analytical tools. So what, what you have here is the constant error uh, that is uh, the difference between the produced and the target interval. And you can see that both humans and monkeys underestimate intervals in the range of, of, of the durations that we tested, but they are pretty good. In addition, we found that both uh, primate species showed an increase in variability of the temporal responses as a function of the interval, which is uh, a form of weather law. And in time, it's called scalar property that has been um, described for a lot of tasks in many species. Uh, but something that we found is that the asynchronies that correspond to the time between the stimulus and response in the monkeys were around uh, 250 milliseconds. And a lot of people said, well, that means that they are responding. They are not predicting to the, the beat. So to try to answer whether they could or not, we changed our task. And the main modifications were uh, first, we included a perception phase in which the monkey had his hand on the lever and was just perceiving the metronome without moving and then getting the beat. And then they're supposed to synchronize. But in this case, the asynchronies, the time between the stimulus and response, were part of the reward contingencies. If if the response was without a window of, uh, of the asynchrony, 
uh, the trial was aborted. So the monkey learned to predict and to respond around the stimulus. So what I'm showing here are two polar plots of the asynchronies, where zero means a perfect time between the stimulus and the response. And then here you have a polar distribution of the mean resultant uh, for different durations. And you can see clearly that the monkeys are able to predict or to respond with less than 100 milliseconds after the stimulus. And these are two monkeys. And when we test them in, in a task in which there is no regularity of the stimulus, there's a random presentation of different intervals, and then there is no allow for a prediction, you can see that the asynchronies are much more larger. And in fact, the monkey is reacting instead of predicting. We also tested these monkeys in uh, different tasks. For example, in this case, we have a continuation phase. So this stimuli does not exist. And when compare the asynchronies between when you have an auditory input or we don't, when, when you don't have it, the asynchronies are pretty much the same. Uh, here on the right, what I'm showing is a situation where we omit one of the stimulus. And again, the monkey can predict perfectly well the presence of a beat that is not in this input. So we have measures of timing precision, timing accuracy, uh, timing prediction. But in, in the case of tapping, you also have a, a, a complex kinematics. So something that we have done also is um, to analyze videos to understand uh, the change of position over time so that we have a speed profile as a function of time across our trials. And what we found is that the downward upward uh, movement uh, of tapping in the monkey is divided in two Gaussians. You know, this is the downward movement. And then here, you know, in the dotted line, you have the, mo the movement of, of the tap. And then you have the upward movement that is again, another Gaussian. So if what we do is we use a, a, an arbitrary threshold, uh, we are able to divide uh, the kinematics in two important pieces. The movement time in red and the pause between movements or the dual. So what we did then is to compare the duration of the movement and the duration of the pause. And what we saw is something very interesting because we found very similar movements across all the durations that we tested which means the monkeys learn to do a very stereotypic movement. And how they solve the tap is by waiting during uh, the dual time. So during the pause between movements, you have different durations. And in fact, when you compute the variability, uh, you can see that most of the variance um, of the scalar property uh, is focused on the dual. So what we can say then is first, monkeys can produce rhythmic intervals with proper tempo matching. The variability in the rhythmic tapping follows the scalar property. And when immediate feedback about timing in each movement is provided, monkeys can predictively train to an isochronous speed, generating tapping movements in anticipation to the metronome goals. Now, there's a lot of psychophysics in monkeys, and we have, we have been able to compare their abilities with humans. But I'm a neurophysiologist, and I'm very interested in trying to understand how the brain times beats. So initially, we um, suggested a general hypothesis that timing depends on a partially distributed mechanism that has two main pieces. The first one is a main core timing network that includes the supplementary motor cortex, the basal ganglia, and the motor thalamus. And then a series of context-specific structures 
that when they interact with the main core timing mechanism, they uh, uh, show all the richness of timing behaviors that we can measure across perception and production of time intervals. And so we have been focusing on uh, these areas, at least at the beginning. And just for notation, the media premotor cortex is considered in my lab uh, a, con a conjunction of pre-SMA and SMA areas. And for these uh, experiments, we use uh, Thomas recording uh, systems that allows you to, to record seven or 16 electrodes simultaneously. And uh, well, we use um, imaging to place our recordings. You, you have the recording sites for two monkeys. Initially, what we did was to focus on the instantaneous responses of single neurons during our task. And the first type of neurons that we found are, were neurons that were very stereotypic across all uh, durations. So they, were, they have a very stereotypic response before the tapping that is zero here. We also find what we call relative timing cells. These are cells that showed uh, a change in slope, a decreasing slope as a function of duration, and they tend to reach all of them a peak at a particular time. So these are neurons that seems to be uh, associated with quantifying uh, how much time is remaining for the tap. And these types of cells have been described in different uh, motor areas for different timing tasks. In addition, we also found neurons that show an up and down profile of activations. We, will, we call these absolute timing cells that show then an increase in response duration as a function of the produced interval. And these cells that seems to be some sort of sand clock. So these cells are accumulating uh, time by increasing the discharge rate as a function of uh, elapsed time. But these were not the only responses that we found at the single cell level. We found also complex cells um, that were tuned to the duration of the intervals. So when we focus on, on the general discharge rate of cells, we found neurons like this one that were specialized in short intervals. So that when you uh, plot the discharge rate as a function of the target duration, you can define a tuning curve and you can define a preferred interval. And at the level of the population, what we saw is that all the possible uh, tested durations were represented in the preferred intervals of the cells. Interestingly, these cells also had tuning for CL order. So what I'm showing here in, in A is a clustering analysis where uh, each column are the six sequential uh, order elements of our task, the three synchronization followed by the three continuation intervals. And each row represents a single neuron. This is the normalized activity of each neuron. So you have on the top cells that are specializing on the first, second, third, and so on. So these are neurons that are counting are counting in which part of the uh, sequence the monkey is. So for example, in B, that is this row, you have a raster of a neuron that is specializing for the fifth serial order element of the task, and also have a preference for longer durations. In C, you have another cell that has a preference for the fourth and fifth element of the sequence, and it has a preference for shorter durations. So it seems that the medial premotor areas are able to multiplex duration and serial order to represent these two parameters at the population levels. However, we found that these uh, responses were far from static. So these are uh, very time varying uh, responses uh, what I show here is a population of cells that are tuned for serial order or duration that have been sorted by the peak of activity. And then you can see that there is a progressive pattern of activation of neurons 
across the serial order of our task in both populations. So we have here a, a pretty complex dynamics. So it seems that timing depends not on single cells, depends on populations and neurons that are dynamically interacting. So to try to describe this quantitatively, what we did is to um, use the reduction of dimensionals over time. Um, we use not only principal component analysis, we use many different uh, reduction, uh, dimensionality reduction methods. But the main goal of this is to uh, project high multidimensional time series of responses into a state space, low dimensional um, uh, framework in which uh, what you are um, getting is the covariance in the neural activity of the population. So what we did do is that we beam the neural activity of hundreds of thousands of neurons. And so we project this beam activity using the coefficients of uh, our, our uh, principal component analysis to get um, our latent variables that are time series in different dimensions. And then you can get a dynamic system representation in state space that allows you to, to know how the populations are covariant dynamically across the task. So what I'm going to show here is a video in, two, in 3D or 2D, and here is the behavior of the monkey, of more than 1,500 cells uh, projected in this state space uh, for one of the conditions. So initially, the state space starts in the spontaneous activity. And then uh, suddenly, it reaches a particular orbit. And from this orbit, it starts to oscillate. So a very important property of these uh, dynamics is that the populations uh, generate a period for each produced interval. I'm going to play it again. So it reaches an orbit, and then you can see how for each produced interval, you have a periodic activation. So another important property of these neural trajectories is that they have an increase in amplitude as a function of tempo. So shorter intervals have a shorter or a more restricted circular trajectories, like the one in uh, green, whereas longer durations have larger amplitudes. And we measure that in the synchronization and the continuation phase of our task. So if, if, if we compute the radius of these neural trajectories, you can see a monotonic increase as a function of target interval, which is not the case for the linear speed, which it's more or less constant. In addition, we found something that, that I think is crucial. The variability of these um, um, neural trajectories increase as a function of the target interval. And you know, accounts for the scalar property. So what I'm plotting here in, uh, in magenta is the variability of the behavior of the monkey. So you can see a clear linear increase in the tapping variability, which is similar to the variability in the amplitude of the neural trajectories. And another important uh, aspect of these neural trajectories is that they have an attractor behavior during uh, the tapping. So what you have here, these are the numbers of um, different tapping times for uh, a short duration in green and for a long duration in red. So every time that the neural trajectory reaches this particular attractor, you have a tap. So we, we think that this is a narrow correlate of the internal beat representation. So to try to measure this uh, in a consistent fashion, what we did is to measure the distance between an arbitrary point 
and the moment at which uh, and the tapping time and the distance between this arbitrary point and the half inter tap uh, position. And you can see a quite constant distance at the tapping time, suggesting that yes, this is an attractor and yes, probably this is signaling of beat, beat, beat. So summarizing this part of my talk, you can say that medial premortal cortex neuronal activity show a strong periodic pattern when projected in a lower dimensional state space during our, our synchronization continuation task. Uh, each produced interval is represented as a periodic loop in the neural trajectory conforming a generating pattern of big base temporal predictions across the rhythmic sequence. The neural tra trajectories converge in similar state space at tapping times, resetting the big base clock at this point. Hence, the convergence of this neural attractor state could be the internal representation of the pulse that is transmitted as a facet top-down predictive signal to the auditory areas before each tap. Of course, this is a hypothesis. And the scalar property, a hallmark of timing behavior, was accounted by the variability of the curvilinear radia in the neural trajectories. So, some time ago, with my friend Hank Jan Koning, that is uh, in the University of Amsterdam, we suggested the gradual audiomotor evolution hypothesis, which um, mainly is um, suggesting that beat perception and entrainment emerge gradually in the primate order. So, the, the human flexibility to entrain to complex human beats depends on the close dynamic interaction between the auditory areas and the motor machinery in the human. And we are suggesting that the monkeys have all the basic audiomotor machinery to deal with the isochronous metrics. Um, so what we did then is to try to compare what happens when uh, monkeys use visual metronomes versus auditory metronomes. Um, and again, we use the synchronization task that has a perception phase and an entrainment phase with uh, different durations. And in this case, an important change was that instead of using acute recordings, we use semi-chronic recordings using uh, high density uh, silicon shock recordings. Um, this uh, technology then allows you to, to record around 150 simultaneously recorded cells. And then we can do um, analysis on the single trial basis. So what I'm gonna show, show you here it are the neural trajectories uh, during our task uh, for auditory in the blue colors or visual in red, uh, but yeah, what you can see again that is that these trajectories are periodic. Each produced interval is a loop in these circular trajectories. The green dots represent the tapping times. And you can see again that um, longer durations produce trajectories that are larger in amplitude. And you can see also there are differences between modalities. So something that we have done with these neural trajectories is um, to characterize different manifolds. So these are the planes in which you can explain uh, the, the largest variability for a particular parameter. So in this case, for example, you have the manifold for uh, duration, you can, you can see clearly uh, the increase in amplitude as a function of duration for both modalities. We can also find uh, the subspace for the tapping, which will be the attractor 
uh, where um, the neurons meet, well, the, the populations meet every time the monkey is producing a tap. And we also found the modality subspace, which forms some sort of a triangle. And the shared barrier, the angle between these two uh, subspaces is around um, eight, 18 degrees, which means that uh, there is a partially distributed representation uh, for auditory and visual responses in these medial promoter areas. Something that we, we are doing now very carefully is to try to understand how the kinematics of the neural trajectories is, are related with different uh, behavioral parameters, including the movement kinematics of the monkey. So in fact, what I'm showing here is the hand speed during tapping. The red lines in this case represent the tapping times. You can see again these double Gaussians for the downward and then the out outward movements. And so we can also identify the dual between movements. So, and over, overlay, what you can see here is the speed of the neural trajectories. So it's interesting because the speed of the neural trajectories have also a double Gaussian, but one of, of the Gaussian has a peak just at the beat. And the other has a, a peak around half the due time. So it seems that you have populations that are quantifying the pause between movements and neurons that are just triggering when the internal representation of the beat is occurring. And these two that the population seems to be interacting in a very uh, dynamic fashion. And this is the same, but in the case of the visual condition. So, you know, as I said, since we are able now to record hundreds of simultaneously recorded neurons, we, we can do trial by trial analysis on the geometry of these neural trajectories. And what we are doing is to try to correlate the, the timing, the error correction, and even the errors made by the monkeys with different uh, properties of the neural trajectories. In addition, another thing that we are doing is um, to characterize these um, progressive um, uh, patterns of activations of neurons and, and try to characterize different populations of neurons and see how these different populations of neurons have an impact on the neural population trajectories. So here what I show is uh, the mutual information uh, profile for a population of uh, neurons as rows. Uh, and this is the mutual information for duration that allows you to, to quantify uh, in not parametric fashion how neurons are encoding different parameters. So for example, here we have a population of neurons that have a preferred uh, in a longer interval. And then you can see again, these moving bones, these patterns of neural activation for these populations of cells, neurons that are attuned for auditory or neurons that are attuned for visual. And what we're trying to, to see is how these subpopulations of neurons then play a role on the overall neural trajectory dynamics. So summarizing these preliminary uh, unpublished results, we can say that the amplitude of periodic neural trajectories increase as a function of target intervals for both auditory and visual metronomes. Once the state trajectory reaches the response manifold, the tapping movement is gated across durations, modalities, and rhythmic sequence elements. And the angle between duration and tap manifold was almost orthogonal, supporting the notion that different cell populations are engaged in beat timing and the execution, the execution of the tapping movement. And uh, modality subspaces have a small angular difference uh, between auditory and visual conditions, suggesting a partial overlapping sensory input. 
in uh, these premotor areas. Now I'm going to show something even more preliminary, but I think it's a very exciting um, experiment. Um, because now we are just wondering how the brain uses these internal beat representations uh, and uh, communicate with the input. So for that, what we, what, we, what we are doing is to try to characterize the bottom up and top down loops during our synchronization tapping tasks and um, trying to identify different close action perception loops and online corrections. Um, and for that, we are recording in different areas simultaneously. So we are recording in um, the core auditory area, the belt posterior areas, uh, and the pre-SNA initially. And we are trying to identify a series of crucial elements in these cognitive behaviors. The first one is, of course, the, the auditory input and the representation of the metronome in the auditory cortex. And then how attention signals, how um, the corollary discharge of the tapping signals, how um, the consequences of our actions that will be the reafference of the tapping are influencing uh, the auditory processing and how these influences can allow you to generate an error prediction signal that is calibrating then the internal um, representation of the beat in the premotor system. So for that then, we, we placed uh, this uh, highly dense uh, shank of silicon in the core auditory areas, in the belt, in pre-SMA, in the primary motor cortex and the putamen, and also in posterior parietal cortex. And then we have different modalities of recordings in the same animal and can be acute in the case of deep areas such as um, the auditory areas or the putamen. We have also semi-chronic recordings where uh, these shanks are mounted in a micro drive that allows you to move in the Z axis, the electrode. And we use different electrode configurations depending on whether we are recording in, uh, in superficial areas or in, uh, in the deep areas. So this is how the, the um, implant looks. You have here the recording uh, chamber for uh, acute deep recordings. And these are uh, the micro drives uh, to move these shanks in the Z axis. In this case, uh, we put a, a fair amount of effort um, to have a, an auditory lab. So these open field auditory stimulus are very well calibrated so that we, we can really study auditory responses uh, with high precision. But the monkeys are doing pretty much the same task. So is a task that has a perception at epoch where the monkey is not moving, but he's just listening to these isochronous metronomes with different tempos and a, a synchronization phase where the monkeys tap in synchrony with the stimuli. We also have a passive situation in which the monkey listens to, to the metronomes, but it is not receiving reward and it doesn't have access to the key or to the um, um, to the push button, in this case, is in a uh, light interrupter. And of course, we are able to characterize many aspects of the behavior of the monkey, the predictive behavior or component with the asynchronous. We have uh, the temporal variability that is a measure of, uh, of timing precision, the constant error that is a measure of timing accuracy, and we also have uh, 
what's called the lag one autocorrelation, which is a measure of error correction. So in this case, if the monkey produces a short interval, the next one should be longer to catch the, the metronome. You know, it's going to lose it, and it's going to be an error trial. So the monkeys have pretty strong uh, lag one autocorrelation for all the tested intervals. In addition, we also uh, characterize the tonotopic responses, particularly in auditory areas, but we did this for all the areas that we recorded. So what we do is we present randomly um, pure tones or pass, band pass auditory stimuli with different uh, magnitudes. And this allows you to compute the frequency response area. So for example, here we have a core auditory area, uh, neuron that has a, a preferred tone um, that is very sharp um, uh, of the preferred auditory tone. And um, so with this new experiment, with these uh, simultaneous recordings, we will be able to, to answer fundamental questions about how this internal representation of a beat is dealing with the external world. So we are going to have uh, the ability to um, identify neurons related with passive sensation and, of course, with uh, movement encoders. Uh, more interestingly, we are going to uh, be able to identify neurons associated with uh, active sensory encoding, with internal beat signals, and with error encoders. It allows you to deal then with um, error correction. And what I'm going to show now is, is um, data that are very preliminary and um, somehow they, they are just phenomenological because we have not analyzed this properly. But I'm just, I'm just going to show some properties. Um, and um, we use a, a, a relatively simple uh, tool to try to understand whether the cell responses are aligned to the sensory events of our task, which will be the metronomes, or to the movement events of our task, which will be the taps. So we use a warping transformation on the time series of the responses to see if statistically the neurons are better aligned to the movement or to the stimuli. And for that, we use a, a parameter that is called W, that when it acquires values of zero, means that these are a sensory aligned neuron, whereas if the W acquires a value of one, it's a very well aligned neuron to the taps. Uh, we use a, a you know, minimum likelihood function to try to determine this element. So, of course, when we record in the core area uh, of, of the auditory cortex, we saw neurons with uh, incredibly sharp responses few milliseconds after each stimulus. So this is a raster for a cell during uh, the perception epoch that is um, um, illustrated in orange. And uh, in red, you have the synchronization epoch. So this is a very sharp increase in response. And, and our analysis says, yes, this is an error that is very well aligned to the stimuli. And this probably is an error that is related just to the input. Because when we compare uh, the neuron responses of this neuron, in the passive task in which the monkey is not doing anything, it's just listening, you could see a profile of activation that is really similar to the active task. So probably these are neurons related to the auditory input. But, you know, very fast we saw neurons that are modulated by the context. So in this case, we, 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 I'm showing another neuron, in this case in the belt area, that has modulation in response that are very different in uh, the perception versus the synchronization epochs of the task. Uh, 
And when we do compare it with the passive situation, again, there is a large change in, res in response. So it seems that these are neurons that are uh, modulated by the attentional uh, engagement of the animal in the task. And in the belt, we already see neurons that are aligned to the taps. So this, that statistically, this is a neuron that is uh, very well aligned to the tapping movements, which are shown in blue. And these, they have a temporal relation that is really sharp, just a few milliseconds after each beat. So, and probably these are neurons that are related with a top-down signal reaching the auditory areas from the motor system. When you compare these cells in the passive task, there's nothing. So it seems that these are neurons that are really engaged in uh, the top-down, bottom-up loops uh, related with beat keeping. Uh, in addition, of course, in pre-SMA, um, the motor, premotor, the premotor areas, we, we see uh, neurons that are really related with beat keeping, and again, neurons that are tuned to the duration and to the serial order elements of our task. So it means that we have uh, now a very large uh, job to try to make sense of all these simultaneously recorded cells. Um, and the first thing that what we want to do is to, to have a model-free uh, analysis to try to uh, see all our responses in the synchronization, in the passive task, and uh, with the mapping of the tonotopic responses and see if we can cluster, you know, in an unbiased fashion, our population responses across area using a series of uh, parameters. One of them is uh, the warping analysis, as I showed, that allows you to dissociate neurons that are aligned to sensory, to the motor and uh, complex type of responses between sensory motor type of responses. We will use also uh, what is called the Poisson train analysis that allows you to identify when an error responses and for how long in the task. We will use mutual information of duration, see the order between tasks to try to also see if neurons are encoding parameters and the tonotopy. And with all these, we will create uh, a map, um, a big a dissimilarity matrix to try to see if we can cluster neurons based on their neural properties across tasks without tagging the neurons uh, on the anatomical side. And I think this will be our first scenario to try to understand what was going on. Um, I think I'm done. So before saying goodbye, I would like to thank uh, many people uh, in my lab. This is a, a very um, technically challenging effort. Uh, especially, I would like to thank Janeria Ayala, that is a, uh, a postdoc in my lab. Uh, she's now at NYU. Herman Mendoza, who is another postdoc, is an incredibly uh, brilliant guy um, and very good surgeon. Jorge Gámez, that is now at Caltech, and that is a guy that helped us with all the neural trajectory analysis. Abraham Betarcut, that is also part of this, and uh, Juan Pablo Marquez, that is a young graduate student that is uh, doing a large part of the simultaneously recorded uh, um, experiments, and the te technical uh, help of Luis Prado and Raul, Raul Paulin. I will I also uh, would like to thank many uh, collaborators across across the globe, which they enrich a lot of, of uh, our research. And uh, of course, support is uh, greatly appreciated. And I would like to say gracias por su atención. 
Excellent. Thank you, Hugo, for a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, we've got um, a chance now to be able to have some questions. Um, hold on, I've just got to work out a little bit how I do that. I've got to go on to normal chat. Um, uh, Xiao Xing Wang, can you hear me? Are you yes. able to uh, ask Can you hear me? Yes, great. Thank you. Xiao Xing is going to uh, ask a question. Uh, hi, Dr. Merchant. Uh, thank, hi. You, thank you for a very interesting work. Uh, this is Xiao Qing Wang from Johns Hopkins University in the United States. Yes. So I have a quick question. Um, in humans, uh, um, when we talk about meter, and we talk about often about irregular uh, meters, not a synchronized, not a periodic, you know, for example, when you dance, you have a triple and duple. Is there evidence that the macaque monkeys can perceive that or generate that? You know, not, not, a, not a exactly periodic, but, but a music meter. Is there any yes. evidence uh, macaque can do that? That's my question, thank you. Yes, um, well, we are just trying to answer this question. Uh, and for that, we, we do two approaches. One of them is to record the EEG and uh, the bulk potentials um, of the monkey brain using uh, mismatch negativity protocols or, uh, or using di different type of auditory uh, sequences. So we just uh, submitted a paper in current biology uh, in collaboration with the lab uh, of um, Sonja Kotz that is in, uh, in the Netherlands, where we show that the monkeys are able to do uh, what's called the tic-tac subjective rhythmization process. So in that, uh, in this type of uh, phenomenon, what you have is an audit isochronous auditory stimulus. And since it's so boring, the human brain very fast, you know, think on a tic-tac type of process, you know, so it, it, it accentuates mentally one of the stimuli. And that's very natural and it's a very well characterized um, phenomenon in, in humans. But what we saw is that when you measure this in monkeys, monkeys are tic-tacking too. So we saw a modulation in the beta band um, power that is different uh, for a subjective accent versus a non-accentuated uh, stimulus. So um, it's, it's kind of a, uh, I mean, it's not, it's, it's in, in review. So hopefully we will have a, a paper soon on that. On the other side, we are also uh, training monkeys on um, instead of using uh, a, an isochronous metronome, we are, we are using um, accentuated uh, stimuli, a simple march type of thing. And we'll soon we will know if, whether the monkey can, can follow uh, these type of rhythms. So the answer is, I think they can go and uh, deal with metrics on the march and maybe on the wall side, you know, simple racial rhythms. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask? Please. Yeah, please ask. Hi. Ask Hi, Jane. Uh, Is there any natural use of synchronized beats in their normal behavior of the macaques? I mean, I can't think of anything, but perhaps you know. Well, I mean, that's a good question. And it's, it's, it's a large discussion because uh, naturally monkeys don't have these synchronous uh, interactions between monkeys. I mean, in, 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 in the lab, you can clearly hear the monkeys having a, a rhythmic uh, movement of their cages, for example. And, um, but I don't think they, in their natural behavior, they have a lot of behaviors using um, synchrony uh, with auditory cues. So what we, have, what we are measuring here then is, is more of a, a trained 
type of behavior. And in fact, I have to say that it's not easy to train monkeys with, with auditory cues. In fact, it takes time. So we, we somehow, we, we, these are some sort of uh, very specialized monkeys on, on following the beat. However, once they got it, they're pretty good at it. I, w I wondered whether it was actually in calls or something like that, depending on the tempo. You know, is I, I, I don't think there is nothing different. I don't think there is nothing uh, on that side. You know, I mean, I have spoken with uh, different people dealing with monkeys in nature, not only macaques, but also, you know, big apes. And there is not a large repertoire of uh, behaviors where they use um, rhythmic, you know, rhythmic movements. You know, the gorillas, and you have this, you have yeah. also chimps, you know, tapping in trees. Uh, but this is pretty much about it. Okay, thanks. You're, okay. You're welcome. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Kate Watkins has got a, a question. Kate, are you able to unmute yourself? And Hi. then we'll have you, Juan, sorry, I didn't realize. We'll have you next, Juan. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. It's, lo it's lovely work. Um, I had a question about the sensory reafference. Um, so was there a, I assume you think that's an auditory reafference, but they're presumably also getting somatosensation or proprioceptive. 